Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ICAM Foundation webinar on basics look ahead. My name is Alexander Gordon, and I'm joined by my colleague, Daniel, who will help me on the presentation today. Hi, everybody. So today, as I've said, we'll look uh, at look ahead uh, for the uh, Campos Foundation. So first, we'll take a small look at uh, some of the built-in look ahead functionalities we have inside of the post uh, post processor, and also we will show you some basic macros example uh, for post processing using uh, look ahead features. So for the built-in look-ahead functionalities we're going to take a look at today, uh, we're going to take a look at the startup look-aheads, uh, the look-aheads for tooling uh, during operation events when you have a spindle with coolant encode and also how to populate your uh, tool tab using the PPFUN25. So for the startup look-aheads, uh, this look ahead occurs, it's the first thing that happens when you launch the post processor. Uh, if you press F11, which is the single step inside of the macros, the first thing it will do, it will look for what's your part number, what's the units of your, uh, your program, and what's your machine statement, which is the post processor name, the tape file, and CL file name, etc. Then the next look ahead that normally occurs is the tool look ahead because you'll have a, uh, a little tool uh, afterwards. So that uh, look ahead is on dollar T look. At any point during any look ahead, you can uh, put a conditional test that if uh, the system variable for the look ahead is active is true, then you can do specific stuff. So if you need to do stuff or uh, during a look ahead to either store information or change the behavior a little bit or activate a, a variable, uh, you can do so uh, at that point. But for a tool look ahead, it will trigger on two condition. So if you use the $NT variable, it will do a quick look ahead to see what's your next tool you're gonna be using. Or if you have set the tool preselection uh, in your questionnaire, it will uh, do a look ahead to see what's the next tool. So the tool look ahead, what it does, it goes through the uh, macro until if you're using the, uh, the next tool, it will look all the way to the next load tool and it will process every macro that is tooling related. So if you have load tool, the startup and shutdown procedures for the tool change, or if you have information that would, that would change the tool number uh, inside of a user-defined macro uh, before the next load tool, it will process those macro to make sure that you have really the, late, uh, the most actual uh, value needed for a post. For the operation event, this occurs when you have the operation uh, event procedure active. And every time you would have the op type major word in your CL file, it will trigger the operation event and do the following. It will po uh, populate the uh, system uh, variables, the $OE system variables. So those variables are a little bit special because they have a prefix $OE followed by a dot and then followed by the name of the variable. So you have a bunch of variables av available to you that are automatically populated by the post without having you to set them uh, when using this operation event. It will do the look ahead until it find either of the following, either the next cutting motion, the next op type. So this would occurs mainly when you have a load to uh, when you are in the operation event for a tool change. So you don't have any go to, so it will look for the next operation would be a actual milling or axial or turning uh, operation. Or if you do manually uh, in the post through a macro turn off the dollar OE look to false, this will 
turn off the uh, the look ahead, as would turn off any other look ahead for the its specified variable. So if you are in the tool look ahead and you want to turn off the tool look ahead because you have already gathered the information, you could set dollar tl look uh, t look equal false. As the same thing, you could do dollar oe look equal false here. Or if you reach the end of the file, it will uh, turn off the CL file. So those are examples of the various system variable available to you. Uh, for example, we have the uh, the tooling, uh, the tool number used for that operation. What would be the spindle sp uh, the spindle speed after the op type? What's my first cutting motion or my first motion, etc. If you want a complete list, you have uh, it is available in the Campos user guide on page 161, and if you're using the PDF format, it is on page 177. Uh, there's also a small poll that I would like to uh, have you answer your question. So for the first question, here you go. If you can take the time to answer those questions and with this, uh, we, it would be uh, really appreciated. So to continue on, the spindle plus coolant look ahead. So when you have the spindle with coolant M code defined inside of questionnaire, it is located in the spindle section. Uh, if you do have that M code defined, every time you have a spindle or a coolant uh, major word, the post will do a quick look ahead to see if the other word is present. Uh, and if it is, it will output the spindle with coolant. If it is not present, then it will say it will only uh, output the spindle code or the coolant code, depending on which one you trigger. One note to to take there is that if you're using coolant differing, so if you want to uh, differ your coolant to the the next plunging motion or the next feed rate motion, this will override uh, override the spindle with coolant output. So it will output both codes separately instead of having the uh, the spindle with coolant code. For the PP Fund 25, it is using the same system variable for look ahead as the tool look ahead, so dollar T look. And this, uh, you can have that PP Fund 25 where in two place. The first one is the tooling summary uh, RMD, or if you have a macro that you manually input the PP Fund 25. So again, same thing as the dollar uh, NT. It looks at all uh, at all the macros in the post uh, that affects the tooling and store information inside of a uh, of an array. So that array is uh, it can be up to 200 tools and have 50 variables that can be populated. 20 of them are already populated by the post processor, and you have 30 that you can use as user-defined variables for you to uh, store more information that would not be present in the uh, CL source file or not taken into account as the uh, by the post process. So for the examples we're gonna take a look at today, uh, we're gonna look at uh, how to process the, uh, the sequencing uh, early in the post, how to process your work offset uh, at the beginning, so it, uh, the co uh, code occurs at the same uh, at the place where you want to, and also if it's not present, that you would have a default one, and also a quick macro on how to support uh, rigid tapping on the post. Two for those examples, we're going to be using a new function dollar fget, which lets you take a search for a major word and some of the CL parsing to navigate through the CL file. So $fget looks for a major word that you specify and returns the uh, CL location, the CL line on which that major word has been located. Uh, you can search for one word or you can search for many words using the uh, swirly brackets uh, in the sequence. 
as shown in the example, load, load tool, or turret, it will return the line of the first one found. You can also uh, specify a start and end uh, for your search. So it could be that you want to start before where you are located. If you put a negative value or if you put a zero, it will start at where you are located or it can be uh, further on. And if you don't put a start and end, then you'll need, uh, it will start from the current position all the way to the end of the CL file. You can also have multiple F gets inside as your start and end. So you could, if you don't know exactly where it can, uh, where it start, where it ends, you could use a, F, a dollar F get to find, uh, to specify what's your start and end, depending if it's variable. For a CL parsing, uh, the CL parsing lets you uh, read a re record line. So read the information on the line, uh, for example, on a go-to and store the uh, arguments of the go-to. You can tape write, which will process the actual line and output the corresponding NC code. You can also modify that line by either changing some of the arguments or by uh, simply deleting the line if you don't want to process it. Uh, when we talk about deleting or, or modifying, this is not modifying directly inside of the CL file, but instead modifying it inside of the internal Genair CL file. And we'll, uh, that change will be lost when you exit Genair or when you uh, rewind the post processor. You can also use the search to navigate uh, to a specific place, either return and uh, return uh, in a early uh, CL file location or skip some lines and go further ahead. You also have some functions that are useful, uh, such as the FCL rec that will give you what's your current uh, record number or FC, uh, .fcl, which will give you the arguments on the record line that you've read. The F class and F subclass are some old commands that can be useful, but today they are not really uh, used much because of the dollar F get uh, lets you get that information much easier. So as I've said, we'll do a quick process macro on how to process the sequencing. We'll uh, process or work offset. If we find one, if we don't find one, we will output a default value and then we will uh, output the spindle codes for rigid tapping at the beginning of the cycle, uh, just before the cycle, and change the M code to a M code that would be corresponding to your machine. Let's jump right on to Quest Engineer then, and we will start writing some macros. So here on the left, we have a Quest with a basic three axis 31i post. Uh, this is what you would get as macros and procedures already written if you start a new post and using a FANUC 31i. So as I've said before, I want to process my sequence number uh, according to what's written inside of my uh, CL uh, file. Here we're using a CLS file, a file from NX. And if we see, we have our sequence number starting from 100, incrementing by five, uh, just after tool change. However, if we, uh, we are not currently uh, processing any secno inside of this CL file because of this uh, user-defined syntax inside of the post, and if we look at the output, we see that we increment by one starting from one. So this is not exactly what I want. So the first thing I'll do, I'll go to my register and I'll make sure that my sequence number can go to the maximum amount of numbers. So because right now they would be stuck at uh, 9,999. And I'm gonna delete that secno command to uh, be able to process the secno. So if I rewind and post again, this is how it goes. So at first, 
since we don't have that secno already processed, I use my default behavior from the post, which is increment by one. And once I reach that secno after tool change, I go from 100 to 240. So this is not exactly what I want. So the way I'll do, uh, I'll go in my machine startup macro and I'll do a custom macro, which I will assign to a variable, dollar f get to get my major word secno. I want to start from here and I want to go, let's say, we look to secno, we know that it's coming after the first go to. Okay, so that's good. So dollar f get of go to. So this will return the line where secno is, which what we are expecting is 48. So if I find that line, so if dollar uh, percent L01 is greater than zero, because if it doesn't found it, it will return zero value because it haven't found it. But if it founds it, it will return the CL record line. Then the, I would simply want to tape write it. So process the line. And then I'll do a tape operation to delete the secno already, uh, already processed. And I want to delete the line on which I found the secno. So if I don't delete it, what's going to happen is that I'm going to start at 100, increment by 5, and as soon as I reach the secno again on line 48, it's going to reset to 100 and start from uh, incrementing by 5 again, which is not something that I want. So I need to delete that, uh, tell the post to ignore that line and not delete uh, not use it. And then I'm going to close my end if. So if I rewind, so I compile first, so to make sure the genera knows that I have a good macro. And if I go in my machine uh, startup, now I have my macro right here, and I'll put a breakpoint just before, press F5 to run all the way to this location. So right now we are L01 equals zero because we haven't we haven't processed that signal again. Uh, we haven't searched for that signal yet. It is looking at the percent algebra one from before. So if I press F11, now we can see that the value changed to 48. So we do have found the uh, signal. And now I'm going to be able to step inside of my if statement. So I'm going to tape write, tape up delete, and, and Mac. But we see, oh, I have my N1 is still there. The reason why is because in my startup, I forgot to put it before my save startup, which actually do some output to the tape. So I'll need, I'll need to make sure that my micro, my macro is uh, well located. So I'm just going to rewind. And now if we go and we process, we do have or sequencing happening correctly. One quick thing to show you also is if you want to, uh, that PPFUN25 that I was talking before, if you want to have access to it, we have a macro, a RMD macro available to you, which is the print tooling summary, uh, which is right here. But right now, since the RMD, it's not active, it's not accessible to edit. So the way to do uh, to edit it is go to the user defined syntax macro. Make sure my show RMD macros are active. Go to my machine startup macro, and now I have access to it. But as you can see, I have a RMD uh, RMD ID of 321. Compared to the rest, everything is to one. So if I change it to one, that means my macro becomes a custom macro. And from there, I have access to my uh, actual macro and be able to do any modification I need to do to it. So this is a quick way of doing the uh, processing the signal correctly. So now I'm going to leave it to my colleague Daniel to uh, show you about the cutcom and the uh, uh, the rigid tapping. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, <clears throat> So um, as he was saying, here we'll be managing um, the cutter or the uh, work offset of the machine. Now you see, as you can see here, it appears 
um, or right before the, the actual operation starts. Uh, but if we would like to have it, you know, maybe at the top or with your safe startup, um, then we'll have to do some, a little bit of macro programming to capture the gutter comp, um, the fixture offset codes here and read process it before uh, or, or at an earlier stage. So we'll do that in a machine startup macro and we'll do our custom macro. Now, um, the first line is going to be a title here. We'll just have a fixture offset. So we'll start by writing um, the bread and butter, uh, the, uh, the look ahead. Um, so we'll be using the dollar F get, and we'll be looking for cut com. Uh, and we'll also give it a start and end position. So we'll start from wherever, it decide, wherever we are. So since we're in the machine startup, we'll be at the top of the tape. And we'll end it at another F get uh, for the first, maybe the first go to motion, right? Um, you can see here, um, cut com will always appear before go to, depending on like, some cam systems and maybe at slightly different locations, um, but we're pretty safe, at least in this situation, uh, we're safe to say that we can set it up that we will read or we may read uh, a fixture offset before the first go to motion. Um, so we'll be, setting our end position, right? I want to set end positions just to avoid reading, you know, the whole tape file, especially at very, very large programs, right? So this is the bread and butter of our um, F, uh, look ahead. Now we want, if we were to read this um, or to use this look ahead, it's nice if there's only one cut com command. However, if you can look here, now let's say this cut com command was before the go to motions, then we would have two to check. Now, if this one was before this on adjust or this fixture offset here, then we would have issues, right? So we, we have to some kind of write a logic to process all of the available cut coms and to make sure that we only look for the one that we actually need. And to do that, we'll do a while loop of L01 and wanna make sure that it's greater than zero. That means it found a cut com. Inside of here, inside of the body, um, we'll use the dollar f get arg, which is a function to get the argument of whatever I input inside the parentheses. I'll be looking at the argument of adjust, right? I wanna make sure that the argument of adjust here, or I wanna check what this value here is. Uh, and I'm going to have an if statement where I want to check if that L02 value that we get, L02 is if it's a number. And if it is a number, and this is what we want, right? We want to capture this adjust value and then output it um, however we want. Uh, but that's what we want to check. We want to make sure that this adjust, the value following adjust is a number, right? If it's anything else, we don't need it. But if it's an adjust, if it's a number, that's what we want. So we'll be exiting the loop and we'll be doing um, the output logic after this. And then we can close our if statement here. Um, now you see me write this end if. Um, you can also write, this is a short write of end of if. So I'll keep this here. And then we can also end the while loop. Now this logic is great if you only have one cut com. Now, um, problem is when you're doing this logic, you're basically stuck in an in infinite loop because your LZ run never really gets reset. So what we wanna do is inside of this loop, we wanna do another look ahead to check if when we're, we're let's say we're at this position, and we did not find any cut com command, we wanna keep looking until another end condition, right? And if there isn't any, then we will step out of the loop. If there are some other cut com um, records, then we will keep looping until there are no records left. Now, the reason why we have a start value is if we, put, if we set to zero, 
um, it may be in a position where we're not sure where this is or it's in the same position and all we'll be doing is rereading the cutcom command or the current cutcom command. To avoid that, we'll be using the current position plus one. So we'll be using right after our current record, the position after red grid to start reading from there. So instead of being here at, let's say, line 30, we'll be at 31, and we'll be reading up until our end condition. So this is the loop to check for all possible cut count values um, from a start position to an end position. For our output case here, we'll have an if. And again, we'll check if it's a, if it's a number. And if it is a number, then we will uh, parse that cutcom command, so we will write it. And to avoid uh, reprocessing again during standard processing, we will use a, a tape operation to delete that line. Right. And if, F if L02 is not a number, right, that means that we never stepped inside of here, so we never found a number, then we, we will force a standard or you know a default value of one um, and this will generate your your g54 or whatever g code um, is set as your fixture offset uh, one thing here is as at the top here we want to reset l02 now the reason you'll see why the reason i'm doing this uh, in a second here the reason why we're resetting here L02 is in case we've used L02, um, and in case we don't step in this, we want to make sure that it ha it wasn't uh, there wasn't a number inside of L02, right? And you guys will see what I mean in a second here. So if we roll back on the tape file, and we set ourselves a breakpoint inside of our macro. And we run all the way. You see that L02 is already be populated. So if we didn't, if we did not reset the value, and let's assume that there's no cutcom uh, found in this loop, this would fail. This in this case, it would uh, it would go to this output here, and there's no issue. But let's say there was a number, right? Let's say L02 was a number, then we would step inside of this logic here. Uh, which would be incorrect, right? Because we never actually found a cutcom, a cutcom, a fixture offset command. So we'll be writing some kind of command, whatever command we found. Um, and because of this logic, if this returns zero, since we never stepped inside of this uh, loop here, then we'll actually be writing nothing to the tape, which isn't necessarily the best. Um, so this is a safe, a safe way to ensure that. Um, Whatever was in L02 previously, we flush it out. So now we have a fresh uh, variable. And you could also use a different variable if um, you want to avoid this problem. So if we keep on going here, we'll see that we do have a uh, cutcom here on line 30. So when we step in, our first found our first found cutcom command is at 30. We'll step inside of this loop. Now we'll be getting the argument, which is next to the adjust, which in our case is going to be a number, which is a number two. Therefore, we will exit this loop. And we'll simply output that cutcom value to the tape file and end our macro. Now let's say what happens if we did not have a cutcom. So we'll be using a text editor here. I'll be commenting out this cutcom line. And then we'll rewind the tape. And you'll see here at line 30, we don't have the cutcom anymore. So let's see the behavior of that. All right. And now, because we've set an end condition for, to be at the go to motion, um, and if you look back at the tape, there won't be any cutcom. So if we step in, we will not be stepping into this loop. And because L02 was reset, right? Um, it is not a number. Therefore, we will be forcing a, uh, an initial value. And so this is a good way of processing your um, cutter compensation early in the tape, um, especially if the position 
that it's being output from your CAM system is not um, the ideal so, uh, the ideal location. All right. Um, so that's it for this example. Let's move on to the next example, which is a rigid tapping. Uh, so now we'll assume that our machine that we'll be using here only supports rigid tapping. So we'll be using the uh, standard cycle tap here, and we'll be make, modifying the spindle command so that it's the spindle is output right before the the um, the, the cycle output, and also change the associated M code for the uh, clockwise and counterclockwise rotation to be M29 instead of at the standard M3 and M4. So to start out with that, we'll be writing a user-defined syntax macro. And we'll be catching the spindle command because we want to capture the value and then output it later down the line. All right, so we'll be using $P1 star because we want to capture all the value. Sorry for that. All right, let's put this back size here. All right. So for our logic here, um, since we want to only capture the values that are uh, turns on the spindle, we'll use the dollar f, the function f fine here, and we'll be looking at whatever arguments is in dollar p one, and we'll see if there's an off statement. Right? And when it is an off statement. We don't want to process anything that's inside of this if loop uh, or if conditional statement inside. Right? So if we do find an off, then forget about it. We'll step out and we'll simply output the code. However, if we do not find an off, the reason why I said equal to zero, if it doesn't find an off, then we want to step inside of this body logic. Inside of this, we want to make sure that we find a cycle, right? We'll be here. If you can look at the tape file here, we'll be here when we process this spindle macro. We want to make sure that our upcoming operation is a cycle. To do that, we'll use the fget and we'll look for a cycle. Right? We'll look from the current position and we'll give ourselves an end condition. Now we could have um, different end conditions. However, this time we cannot go with the go to. Right? We want to make sure we catch this cycle here. So if we were to write a go to, then we will never catch the cycle, which is the next position. Um, so if you were to have more than, let's say, more operation, upcoming operations, you could look for things like, you know, maybe a load statement, um, maybe, you know, maybe an op type. Uh, in my case here, I'll put spindle, right? And because we're looking for, um, a group of, or we're looking for multiple words, all right? Whichever comes first, we'll return the value of this f get, and we want to make sure we put them inside of a sequence, all right? And when if we do find one, right? So if we do find a cycle between our current position and whatever statements here, then we want to step inside and do some kind of logic. Inside of here, what we want to make sure is that it, that cycle command is a tapping cycle. So again, we'll use the f find, but this time we'll be using dollar f cls, which returns a, a sequence of the arguments of your current um, CL line. So because we found a, pro, a cycle, dollar f cls here will return a sequence with all these arguments inside. And that's perfect because we can look for tab, which is the cycle we're looking for. Um, and the value that's going to be returned is the position uh, inside of that sequence. Therefore, I can say if, if it finds a value, therefore, if it's greater than zero, what I want to do is store $P1 which is all the arguments of spindle inside of a global variable so I can reuse it uh, later down the line. And I also want to terminate the macro so that I don't process the spindle, right? Um, so this will make sure that when I do come to the spindle command here, I don't process it, right? I'll be processing it later, but I don't want to be processed 
when my conditions are met. Good, next step here, we'll be doing a cycle startup macro. And this cycle startup macro will be used to output the spindle. So we can put a title, output spindle. Um, now we'll be having a couple conditions. So obviously one of our first conditions to check is if the cycle is actually a tapping cycle. Right? And to do that, we can look at dollar at the system variable CY type. Right? If it's equal to four, uh, three or dollar CY type is equal to four. Um, a three and four are for tapping cycles um, of this dollar CY type variable. You can look in the manual for all the numerical representation of all these cycles. Um, you can look for dollar CY type here and it will give you the matching cycle with this numerical value. What we also want to look for uh, to make sure that we're actually, the cycle is being activated and it's being, being turned off. And because we're in the cycle startup macro here, we can use the dollar $P variable here and I'll be using the dollar $P5 here um, when set true if the cycle is being activated. So that's perfect for what I need. And then inside of here, again, we have to output the spindle. Uh, and since we stored it in a global variable, we can use that throughout the post. So I'll simply recall the spindle here. Uh, but we also want to change the M code. And to change the M code, what we can do, and since we want it here, what we can do is use a ppfun command minus nine. Um, this will let us swap M codes with the current syntax, where it's which code you want to change to which number. So I'll be changing the M3 here and replace it with the 29 value. Similarly, I want to change to four with 29. Uh, now we got to watch out here is this command is modal. So any M3s or M4s will be replaced by 29. Now, because we only want it uh, only once during the spindle command, um, we want to reset this ppfun command. And to do that, we'll simply recall the command and reset three to three and four to four. And this is just a quick way to, to change your M codes here and then reset them to their default behavior or to whatever you've set them previously. All right. And, and finally, we also need uh, a cycle macro. And the reason why we need a cycle macro here is because your spindle, if your spindle was off right before a cycle uh, and with the, due to some internal logic, the cycle will be forced to be output. So what we're going to do is behind the scenes, we'll be turning on the spindle with no tape action. And then when we go into our cycle startup macro, that's when the tape or the spindle code will actually be output to the tape. Okay. Um, so I'll show you how you can write that. So we'll, since we know specifically which type of cycle we wanna do, we'll catch a tapping cycle and the arguments are not important in this, in this case, so we'll just catch it inside a $P1 variable. And here, what we'll write is, we'll be using the tape action system variable. So this controls if you have output to the tape or not. And if you wanna turn it off, you can use tape act is equal to false. And to turn it back on, you simply turn it to true. So anything between the false and true statement will not be output to the tape, but can change the behavior internally, right? So if you're turning on the uh, if you're turning on the coolant, then your coolant will be on. If you're turning on the spindle, then your coolant will be on, but there will be no output to the tape. So simply here, uh, since all we want to do is turn on the spindle, you can simply code in uh, spindle and with the with whatever we got, we stored in G01 here in this global variable. Um, the pulse will be more than happy to output uh, your spindle command, even though this, uh, the output is the same. So if you, if you have 300, even though the spindle is at 300, it will still output the code to the tape. Uh, and we wanna make sure we have this output here. 
so that we don't stop the standard behavior of the cycle. Final little change here, or final little addition here. Uh, this global variable, we want inside of a tool change macro, we want to make sure we reset it. Right? And the reason why I want to reset it is in case if you don't have a, a spindle command, uh, but you do have another cycle command that it's not being affected. Or if you don't have a spindle command, right, uh, and you just have a standard, you don't, even though you don't have cycles, right, you don't want this G01 to retain its previous values. Um, so this is the reason why we, we kind of reset it. Uh, we only set it to on so that uh, if we recall what we've been doing, spindle, uh, this will be the result if you never actually change G01 uh, through a spindle command. So this is what you'll see inside of um, when you, it's being, the G01 is being reset, right? You can't put blank or you can't put anything else, all right? You have to put something that can actually be read by a spindle command. So let's go to the tape file and see, um, or let's go to generator and let's see how that works. So we'll be putting a breakpoint here on the spindle on the cycle and on the go to. Let's rewind. Let's hit play. We'll be stopping at this initial spindle command. All right. Uh, so here we're looking to see if it's an off. And obviously, it's not off here. We can look at the dollar P1. It stored 300 RPM and clockwise. So we'll step inside. All right. In our case here, we know that the upcoming operation is a cycle. Therefore, we will the fget will return greater than zero. It will be stepping inside. And uh, we also know that it's going to be a tapping cycle. So we'll be stepping inside here. We'll be storing the value of $P1 inside of a global variable. And we'll be stopping the tape output. Right? So no spindle was output to the tape. Here at the cycle tap macro, you'll see here we'll be recalling this spindle macro with the values. And if we process it, you see dollar $S here was changed from 300 to zero, uh, which indicates that the spindle is being has been turned on. Uh, but there is no output to the tape. Uh, so this is a good way of turning things on or moving things behind the scenes without actually having a tape output. And then we'll simply output the tapping cycle. We'll go to our first motion. All right, so again, our cycle type is equal to three in this case, and we'll, we are activating a cycle. We'll be changing our M3 and M4 with 29. We'll be outputting the spindle with the associated M code. And then here we'll be resetting the codes, and then we can run through um, the end of the tape, uh, the end of the process here. So you see, this is a good way of controlling the spindle output for rigid tapping so that it, ha it happens right before this actual cycle output. And this also shows you a way to change your M codes um, and then reset the M codes later down the line using this ppfun command. Um, so hopefully these three examples showed you guys a little bit of um, how to use the fget and some other functions. Um, but this is all for us for the webinar today. Um, so if you guys have any questions, We'll be taking any questions. Otherwise, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you guys on the next webinars.